been a long time between videos. I'm sorry about that. I just work, life, they've been getting in the way. So I do apologise, but it is what it is. Anyway, something I've been working on for the last week when I've had the chance is this video. And today I want to show you the different ways that miniatures are actually produced today. I will try and talk through each uh, process. And what I've done is just gone around and picked videos that illustrate my points, collated them together, and then I've also just put a little annotation down in the corner of each video where I got it from. So if you want to check out the full videos or maybe other work by those people, you can go have a look for yourself because you might find something interesting there. Anyway, enough of that. Let's talk about miniatures and actually producing them. So when we're talking about producing miniatures, I'm not talking about necessarily the design process. Um, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Instead, what I want to look at is the actual production side of things. So 3D printing, injection molding, spin casting, that kind of thing, which is interesting stuff. So let's look at that now, shall we? So what you're looking at on the screen right now is someone who's actually designed a miniature in a 3D design program. This is the way that a lot of companies do their design now, especially companies like Games Workshop for example. Games Workshop, they really like to use the whole CAD design philosophy and then they make their masters in this same way. They 3D print them with a very accurate 3D printer. The reason they do this is so you get a very high quality miniature and you can design it, tweak it, change the scale, all of that without having to go and change a physical master. It's pretty good. And it also has the advantage of being able to reuse assets. You don't have to sculpt a shoulder pad every time you go and make a Space Marine, for example. You've got that shoulder pad right there and you can just cut and paste it essentially where you need it. You now it's not exactly as easy as cut paste, but it isn't all that much harder either. So, yeah. Moving on from there, you have a more traditional method of casting. And this is one that a lot of us use at home when we backyard cast. It's used in all sorts of things, such as the film industry for making props. Um, I use the same technique for making certain items in the military, believe it or not. Uh, if we were making rec replica firearms, for example, we would actually cast real rifles in urethane resins. And what this is doing is essentially giving you sort of a quick cartoon drawing of it and then going into the actual process physically. So creating the actual mold itself using clay, all the nuts embedded in it are for registration so that the two halves of the mold will line up later. So the first thing they're gonna do is of course fill one half of their mold and once that sets, they then flip it over upside down, re-encase it and then they're gonna seal it up coated in a removal spray and then they're gonna make sure that spray gets in everywhere because you don't want silicon sticking to anything and then they're gonna go through and they're gonna actually pour the second half when they get the chance. Now what he's doing right now with the clay is actually providing a pour point for this mold. So this is the point later on where once the silicon's all been removed and the item being molded is removed they can pour the resin in to the top of the silicon once it's all sealed back up because obviously you've got to get stuff into the mold somehow don't you and that's the whole idea of that so once he's pulled it out slices away any excess material pulls out the pour point and he can pull the two different halves of the mold apart at this point he now has a working mold and he can take out the original put the two halves together pour in resin from the top, and ta-da, problem solved. This next one here, of course, is spin casting. So this is a process used by people like Forge World, for example, uh, Perry Brothers, that kind of thing. A lot of these companies will use spin casting. They have registration points as well, and they line up the Vs on these molds, for example, in order to say which side is which. It's quite simple, really. You place the mold into your spin molding machine, clamp everything down nice and tight as this guy's doing right now, close up the machine, the machine starts to spin up, you pour your molten metal into the top, and usually you have to do a few pours for this to work perfectly because the mold itself has to heat up 
because the metal cools very quickly on hitting the mold. Now it can be done with resin and it can be done with white metal. Obviously let the mold spin down then you can pull the actual plates apart that actually clamp the mold in place then open up the mold and ta-da you've just cast a bunch of figures. It is literally that quick. It is a very quick process. I think people often consider that moulding metal miniatures is sort of a one by one thing or a big automated machine. No, it's as simple as a guy pouring into a spin mould like this. That is how Forge World models are made. Pretty cool, huh? The next one here is actually machining a mould with a CNC milling machine. Now it's not just as easy as machining something because the tool does leave some sort of evidence that it's been through such as um, gouges, small pits, that kind of thing, thin lines, it's not perfect. CNC's are not perfect machines, nothing is, unless you're willing to put a lot more time than it's worth it in. But it's interesting because the CNC will rough out 95% of the mould for you. The kicker is, when you go to finalise the mould, you have essentially a copper version of the item you want to mould, and this actually has an electrical current run through it, and what it does is it actually electrically eats away material from the mould, and it allows you to get an absolutely perfect form-fitting shape out of it. The water, of course, here is for cooling purposes as much as for um, actually transmitting the electrical current you end up with a very fine precision part. And this is how metal molds are made for plastic miniatures. So you can really get some detail in there. Um, that's engraving some little registration marks at the end there so that when they produce the item. This itself is a plastic injection mold. This is a finished one. I've built them before. They could be very simple or very complex. Um, usually defined by the flow pathways and the amount of intricacy of the parts we'll say. So you've got a granular plastic essentially that is screw fed and heated up. As the screw feeds the now molten plastic pellets into the mould under pressure, the coolant that's actually pumping through the exterior of the moulds keeps the mould from expanding, contracting, flexing, cracking, those kind of things and it helps to cool down the item very quickly that's injected into it. Now, some of you have had miscast sprues before, I'm sure, where um, part of the sprue has an air bubble or missing something. That's usually because it was a bit too cold in the area it went into. It does happen, and quality control doesn't always pick it up. It's a very simple process, and I have to use this computer graphic because I can't really show that process to you very easily because it all happens inside a machine. I can, however, show you sort of the beginning and after of that stage. Um, which is what we'll move on to next, once you've got the idea of what's going on in this graphic. This looks pretty boring, doesn't it? Well, it's actually moulding a lot of stuff. That's a whole bunch of parts right there. A whole bunch of parts. Some sort of model kit. All the little pins that are sticking out of the machine are for pushing out the plastic once it's done. Because it slightly, ever so slightly, sticks to the mould. So the mould moves in. And that's how quick the process is. Fills it full and then spits it out. Anyway, that's the plastic injection molding process, the spin casting process, and how we actually make molds uh, at home. As well as that, it also included 3D printing. Why? Because I just felt like doing this video, that's why. Um, I think a lot of people aren't quite sure how molds are made, and I just wanted to demonstrate that. So, obviously, a whole bunch of different ways you can do it. If you look at something like Forge World's Derrida Dreadnought, for example, you can actually see really fine lines on the hull of it, uh, around the torso. The torso is a very smooth surface. 
and you can actually tell where it's been 3D printed. You can actually see the layering, and that process uh, has actually transferred all the way through the master molds and through copy after copy after copy of the Derrida Dreadnought from Forge World. Even now, you can still see some real faint lines from the 3D printing that is just transferred through generations of that Dreadnought because the mold so well captured it. Now, of course, one little thing to talk about is you can't just pour resin and silicons into a mold and make a perfect cast of something. It's a lot more complicated than that. You have to take into account the shape of it, how complex the model is, that kind of thing. Um, but when you do finally do it, you often need to get all the air bubbles out. And that's a big deal. That's why spin casting is used, because the centrifugal force gets rid of the air, or at least compresses the air to such an extent that it doesn't make a damaged model. Now, if you're casting something at home in resin, and you've got a two-part mould you're pouring in from the top, it could be something really basic, like making your own bases, for example, which is where I started casting at home. Well, you want to make a vacuum chamber, or buy one from someone who knows what they're doing. And the whole idea of a vacuum chamber is that it will compress the air. And of course that means the air bubbles disappear or are crushed into a tiny, tiny, tiny little spot and therefore don't affect the rest of your miniature. So just something to keep in mind. Anyway, I'm back with the outer circle. Hope you all enjoyed this video, actually found it entertaining or interesting and I'll see you all next time.